Hey everybody, I'm Michael Pretty Man, and good morning and welcome to Grace Works Church. I'm glad that you are with us this morning. And uh, first of all, let me uh, just uh, praise the Lord for this beautiful weather that we are having here in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and uh, the beautiful colors that we have here. I'm, I'm looking at uh, Lookout Mountain back here in the background and the city of Chattanooga. And uh, it's just been a beautiful fall that we've had so far. I encourage you to get outside. I'm at Raccoon Mountain right now uh, shooting this video. But uh, I wanted to give you a, a couple of brief announcements. One announcement, and the main announcement I'm going to give you is uh, Sunday, uh, excuse me, not Sunday morning, but Sunday, November the 21st, we are having our church-wide Thanksgiving dinner. And uh, uh, all of you are invited. Uh, there are sign-up sheets. We've had, I think, up to this point as I'm shooting this video, about 80 people who have signed up for that so far. So be sure to sign up for that. Uh, you can find information about that in the bulletin or the newsletter, which that is my next announcement. Be sure to sign up uh, for the newsletter. If you are not receiving the newsletter, please ask us about that. Uh, we have so many announcements that there's no way I can get them all into this video. So please sign up for the newsletter, read your bulletin, and that will help us out so much. But anyway, I hope you guys have a great day. And uh, be sure to get outside and enjoy this beautiful creation while we still have some color on the trees. And uh, once again, have a great day, and I will talk to you later. Bye-bye. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you this morning coming in, coming to worship. And I want to welcome our guests that are here today. Thank you for being with us. When you watch that video, did you notice it almost didn't look real? The first time I saw it, I thought, hey, did you kind of compose Do you have a green screen behind you or something like that? Uh, yes, Michael's not with us today, and uh, Brother Bill's not with us today. I'm flying solo, so y'all pray for me. Pray for me. I would go solo up just about every week, but uh, anyway, uh, Michael's out of town uh, today, and Brother Bill is doing He's just as a precautionary measure, um, stayed at home, quarantined, finishing up his quarantine. So y'all continue to pray for him, pray for Michael, and let's pray for our worship in this place right now. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege and the honor to come together as family to worship you. May our eyes, may our hearts be focused on you. And may we see and experience you through this time that we have. Be glorified in your children. Be glorified in this place, we pray. Amen. with me. 
I'm living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus Let me go down, down, down in history As another blood or faithful member of the family And if they all forget my name Well, that's fine with me I'm living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus Cause I'm just a nobody Trying to tell everybody All about somebody Who saved my soul Ever since you rescued me You gave my heart a song to sing I'm living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus I'm living for the world the world to see nobody but Jesus good morning grace works please stand a moment and turn and wave to somebody that you know or maybe even wave to somebody that you don't know and join with us as we lift our voices in song
Come to a very special moment. You may be seated. The special moment is not that you can sit down. This very special moment is a time when we as a church family bow our heads and give thanks. It's our desire that Grace Works be a church that is thankful and we express our gratitude to God, the one we know. And so I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and give thanks for at least one thing. Don't bow your heads and just close your eyes and kind of drift off. Give thanks for one thing, but I'll challenge you, just keep giving thanks. Think of all the things. I have a Holy Spirit to bring to mind that which you're thankful for, that we need to be thankful for. Would you pray at this time?
Father God, for amazing grace through the blood of Jesus Christ, your son. Now be with Brother Tony as he presents the message and open our hearts that we may receive it. For it's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. I'm thankful for Michael Prettyman. I'm being serious. <laughs> Not just in his absence, but in the impact that he has on our church family. This past Wednesday, we had a service honoring our veterans. It was one of the more moving experiences for me to recognize our veterans. And I was, it wasn't just the fact we had those present who had served, they have made a major impact on my life. But Michael had planned this out himself. And when we finished, many were going, wow. It was extremely moving. Uh, this time last year when I became lead pastor, my challenge to Michael was, Michael, your job is to give your job away. And I said, I want you to be able to be, be out and we not miss a beat. And sure enough, he has learned to empower and equip others to lead in worship. Wayne, thank you so much, worship team. Thank you so much. And Michael, thank you. Hopefully he's watching us right now. Uh, hopefully he is up by now. And uh, I really appreciate his ministry and his ministry to me in particular. Recently, I had to go into our attic to retrieve an item. As I made my way up the stairs to the attic, I was overwhelmed by what I encountered. It was boxes just strode all over the attic. There were empty boxes. Why empty boxes? And it was a collection of things we've accumulated over the years. And so at that very moment, I made it my personal project, my goal to clean up the attic, clean up our storage, all of this by Christmas. So you can ask me how well I did. I've already begun. The first tote that I pulled out of the attic, it, it was just random things thrown there. But one of the items that caught my attention was a stack of family photos. Photos of my wife and my three daughters. And uh, instantly the perfectionist and the organizer in me said, okay, let's organize these. And I began to put all the pictures of Madison in this stack, Megan in this stack, and Macy in this stack. I had to have help. Because as I got to the baby pictures of my daughters, yes, I didn't couldn't distinguish between which one was which. And yes, I asked my wife, who is this? My daughters tend to look very similar as infants, small children. And she would tell me what each person was, which, which, which girl was each. Now, I know my daughters. I just couldn't recognize them as small children. But I know them, not just by appearance, I know them from doing life together. I know what makes them happy and what hurts their feelings. I know a lot of their life goals and dreams. I know them because we've experienced life together. This morning, we're going to be looking at the idea of how well 
Do we know God? I want you to answer that question for me today. How well do you know God? And how recently, how have you grown in your knowledge of God? We're going to be looking at two passages of Scripture. One is Acts 17, so if you don't have your notes in front of you, turn to Acts 17, and I want you to put your hand there and find the Psalms, because we're going to be looking at Psalms 44, and just hold it open. I'll, we're going to look at Acts first, and then we'll turn to uh, the passage uh, in Psalms. In August of 2019, I had the privilege of going with a group of members from this church to Athens, Greece, where we served on a mission trip. At the end of the week, we had the privilege to take a day of R&R &R and go visit some of the sites around Athens. And we went to the Acropolis, where the famous Parthenon, the ruins of the Parthenon are located. And after that, we walked down the hill because it sits on a, a hilltop where everyone can see it in the city. We went down below, and there's a, a rocky cliff. And so many people have been there, it's almost slick. This was what is known as Mars Hill. This was the place where the Apostle Paul, when he entered into Athens, after speaking to the Jews, he found all the learned people of Athens, and they brought him to Mars Hill because this is a weird place where they would sit and debate the issues, where they would learn. The Stoics, the Epicureans, they all came together to quiz Paul. They always were interesting in what's the latest, what's new. And at this time, Christianity was relatively new. And so they wanted to hear from him, what are your thoughts? In Acts chapter 17, we're just going to look at a small passage of what took place. And I would encourage you to go back and read 16 and following. But in Acts chapter 22, we find Paul addressing these wise men. Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I had passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. Now, please go back and read because he gets into detail about that which he believes. The one who has created, the one who has given us life, the one who has redeemed us. But what I want to emphasize is the fact that the, the Athenians had all of these gods, and yet there was one that they, were, they didn't know who it was, the unknown god. It is said that in Paul's day, there was probably about 10,000 people in the city of Athens. And with these 10,000 people, there were more than 30,000 idols, statues to the various gods. They were people that were somewhat religious. And what I want you to see here is being religious is not enough. Being religious does not mean that one knows God. You can go through the motions. You can attend a worship service. You can be part of a Bible study. You can even call yourself a Christian and not know God. The Athenians placed an idol up and said, this is the unknown God. And this demonstrated the idea that the Athenians were hungry for God. Yet, it also testified that there was a spiritual emptiness there. They didn't know this God. They didn't have a personal relationship. They didn't have a personal experience with this God. So he was unnamed. They were hungering for God. Whether we realize it or not, the world that we live in is hungry for God. The only problem is they're seeking it. They're seeking something they don't know and filling the void of God with a different kind of lifestyle. Here you see the religious were missing out. They were ignorant to who God was. They did not see, they did not experience God. But also notice here, in this passage, to know God is to experience Him. Knowledge of God is experiencing Him. 
This is not an idea that you can you, uh, know him intellectually. To know him is to experience his hand. To see him at work. To have a personal encounter. We worship today. We've come together to worship that which we know. That which we have experienced. Have you experienced God? Are you going through the motions? Is he an unknown God to you today? Here in this passage you see uh, Paul saying, You don't know what I have experienced. For I know God. To know God is to experience him. And when the Bible says knowing God, it does not mean that you know him in your mind. It doesn't mean, know, mean that you know him intellectually. Not that you know about him, but that you've had a personal encounter with him. That you see him on a day-to-day -day basis. How well do you know God? When we speak about this idea of knowing, it's the root word that is used to describe Adam's relationship with Eve. To know. This same word, it points to the idea, and it's rooted in the idea of experience. Doing life together. That's how you and I get to know one another. We don't get to know one another by sitting in a room together. We have to be doing life together. The word experience and knowing, it's a verb. It's not a noun. It's an ongoing encounter. It means to feel, to touch, to see God. The fault of many is it's not a matter of not knowing God, but not wanting to know God. Paul, when he wrote to the church at Rome in the first chapter, he, he mentions the idea of our status, where we are, our condition, our sinful nature. And notice he says here in verse 18 of Romans 1, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. He has made himself known. He is a God you can know. He's a God you can experience. And yet Paul, when he says here, he says, no excuses. It's not a matter of me being accessible. It's you don't want to know me. You suppress. You're, you make sure you don't feel anything, show anything. You're not affected by God. You suppress the truth. You suppress an experience with God. Many people are rejecting the gospel today because not because they perceive it to be false, but because they're wanting to see it and there's nothing there. And the reason I mention this is because the world needs to see a people who know God, who've experienced Him, whose lives have been changed by him, people who have experienced him on a day-to-day -day basis, not once way back when when I realized I needed to be saved, but on a daily encounter and experience with him. People need to be able to know God. And it's up to us. It's up to us to share our experience now turn with me to Psalm 44. I'm amazed at how God's Word constantly affirms different passages, whether it's in the Psalms or in the book of Acts, where hundreds of years have passed, how they continue to reinforce truths. Many point out, oh, there's contradictions. I constantly see how God's Word from cover to cover is true and how it only speaks constantly back and forth about the experience that we can have. As we look at uh, Psalm 44, uh, follow along with me as we read verses 1 through 8. Our God, we have heard with our ears. Our fathers have told us what deeds you performed in their days, in the days of old. You with your own hand drove out the nations, but them 
you planted, you afflicted the peoples, but them you set free. For not by your own, not by our, their own sword did they win the land, nor did they own their own arm save them. But it's your right hand. It's your right hand that has saved them. You're th- it's been the light of your face, for you delighted in them. You are my king, O God, ordained salvation for Jacob. Through you we push down our foes. Through your name we tread down on those who rise up against us. For not in my bow do I trust, nor can my sword save me. But you, you have saved us from our foes and put to shame those who hate us. In God we have boasted continually and we will give thanks to your name forever. And as you read the words of the psalmist, you see... He's encouraging us, for us as we take this together, he's wanting you to make sure that you share with others your experience with God. It's not what you keep to yourself. Paul, or excuse me, the psalmist mentions here, oh God, we've heard with our ears. We have heard from our fathers the deeds that you did in the past. It was somewhat the nature of that culture for the Psalms and even beyond, that truth, experiences with God, were communicated through oral tradition. In other words, by word of mouth. It was not a mess, uh, necessary in Genesis. You opened it up, there it was. A lot of credit is given to Moses, who lived hundreds of years later, that penned Genesis, the words and the experience of the creation. They would share, the forefathers, the grandparents, would share with their children and grandchildren what God had done in the past. Now you may be saying, well, somebody got the details wrong. No, it was that important that you memorized it. And you made sure you said it correctly. Because there are others around you to make sure you were saying it right. To share what God had done. How they had experienced God. Make sure that you share with others your experience. In the first part of the Psalms, it's making a reference to the crossing of the Red Sea. And here you see the instructions of Moses. Remember Exodus 14, he says to those coming out, he says, stand and watch. As they stood by the Red Sea, he says, stand and watch God. The Red Sea crossing was not about stepping out in faith. No, he says, stand. Watch what God does. When God delivered Israel from Egypt, pulled them out of slavery, he threw threw the plagues at them, at the Egyptians. And what did Moses say? Watch. Watch. Keep your eyes open for these experiences. And here it says, we have heard from our fathers And then when the Israelites made their way to the promised land, they got ready to cross the Jordan. They fight their first battle. It's the battle of Jericho. Do y'all remember the battle of Jericho? Remember how they walked around the city? It wasn't that they climbed the walls. They went for a week walking around the city. And then the walls came tumbling down. What did the Israelites contribute to the downfall of that city? Obviously, they were obedient to the instruction they were given. But did they have a battering ram to knock down the walls? No. No. In that particular situation, they had nothing to contribute. It was stand and watch. Watch God. Watch what He does. And it was a story that the grandparents shared with their children, shared with their grandchildren. And then last week, how many of you remember last week's message? great one okay there's gonna be a test next week on the sermon watch nobody show up last week i won't won't call on you last week we looked at the last in a series of messages from ephesians ephesians chapter six remember that and we talked about spiritual warfare and we talked about equipping yourself clothing yourself with the full armor of god do you remember what victory was Victory was not fighting against Satan and beating up on him. 
It was not defeating the forces of evil. Do you remember what it said in Scripture? Stand firm. Stand. Because who's going to fight this battle? God is. God is the one that's victorious. Do you see the theme that continues over and over? Stand and watch. Stand and know what God is doing. One of my favorite expressions in the Psalms is Psalm 46.10. It says, be still and know that I am God. Be still and experience me at work. We need to share that experience. Share with others how you know God, how you've seen and got to experience Him lately. As I was preparing this message, God spoke to me during my devotion time. He said, Tony, how have you got to know me better lately? How have you experienced me lately? That's right, I preach to myself sometimes. But... I began to think back to my week. And like I said, last Sunday I warned you. I said, be prepared. This week is going to be probably when Satan comes after you really good. I was tiptoeing around praying God protect me. And instead of encountering attacks, God blessed my life. For multiple times this week, this past week, God blessed me with the testimonies from Grace Works. It started last Sunday. Before I could get out of here, a lady approached me, and unsolicited, she said, I want to share with you. She goes, I lost my infant son when he was two years old, and it's been 30 years. And as I look back, I see how God has grown me. How I've gotten to know God better. How I've experienced God. And yes, this lady was hurt. She still grieves. But in our encounter, she shared about what God had done. How he'd made himself known in spite of tragedy. Another day, I had one of our leaders come to me. And I don't even know why they came to the church office. But we got into a conversation which led to them sharing their life story of broken relationships. They shared how... There was a time of wavering in their faith, in their walk with God. They shared how a particular church, when they finally made the decision to come back to church, didn't speak to them. But instead of being negative, this individual looks back and sees how God moved them over their lifetime. Gave credit to God. They shared their experiences with me. Someone sent me a text this week and said, Here's my devotion time. This is how God blessed me. How he spoke to me. They heard and experienced God through their devotion time and shared that with me. Make sure, make sure that you share with others your experience with God. I had another encounter the same week. Someone came to me and they shared this week about their experience with our life groups. If you're not familiar with life groups, it's a vital part of our church, encouraging you to be in Bible study. And these life groups, are the priority is to do life together. And this individual began to share about her life group. She was beaming how in her life group she's experiencing what it means to be the family of God. Those individuals in her life group are her brothers and sisters, and they're sharing their life, their experiences of God together. What a blessing. My week wasn't over. Friday, one of our other life groups said, hey, we've got a sister who's in the hospital. We need to do something for her. They said, we don't want to send flowers. We want to do something very special for this person. We want to go to her house and clean up. And so Friday morning, I went over and witnessed a life group some individuals in a life group getting their hands dirty. You know what I saw? I saw people being used by God. What an encouragement to me. What an encouragement. And how these individuals, whether they realized it or not, they were sharing their experience. And what was I doing? I was seeing God in each situation. How different each one was. 
couple observations from my experience. Some of these testimonies took a lot of time, years. And looking back over that time, they saw how God had his hand on them. Also, you'll notice in those testimonies, those experiences did not have to be Red Sea miracles. They did not have to be the miracle of an incredible healing. One was in while they were in the Word. Another was ministering to the, their sister. Often we're looking for God and we're wanting Him to do something incredible, impossible, remarkable. And all the while, God's at work around us right now. He's doing a work in us right now. Make sure that you share that experience. I need to hear it. Everyone in here needs to hear and experience Him and know Him. You notice how as I share this with you, my experience of God was based on those who shared their experience with me. Just like I said, the world needs to know God. And how are they going to know Him? We must be sure that we share our experience. We must make sure that we're encountering Him on a day-to-day -day basis. Be sure that you share. And be sure that you have a personal relationship with God. I wonder if that's not the reason why we don't share more often. We don't have that one-on-one -on -one with God. The writer here in the psalm, notice here, he knew God. Do you notice the, the language that's used? He's not talking about God. He's talking directly to God. He shares how it is your hand. It is your sword that brings victory. It's not mine. He's talking directly to one he knows. He has this relationship with God. He talks to him. But yet, we have the tendency to rest on other people's experience, other people's faith. We need to share, and it needs to be impact our lives. But it's so easy for us to rest in the faith of our parents, rest in the faith of our grandparents, and never have that personal relationship. We know people by experiencing them, encountering them, doing life together. To know anyone is to experience them. And knowing about them, you don't personally know them, do you? You know about them. You may have a bunch of information about someone. We know a lot of people that are on TV. But do we truly know them personally? Do we have an ongoing relationship with them? Or do or we have that relationship based on what we see on TV? How would you know your spouse? How would you know your spouse if you depended on knowing them in your mind and knowing them intellectually? It would be a sad kind of a relationship, wouldn't it? Here he is focused on this idea of having a personal relationship. Also notice in the Psalms here, once you've truly experienced God, be sure to give credit where credit is due. In Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it addresses the idea of salvation. He says, for it's by grace that you are saved through faith. It's not of yourself so that no one can do what? Boast. We like to put a a lot of attention on ourselves. And here the psalmist is saying, he deserves the credit. He says, I will continually boast about you. And I will give thanks for you. What should be our response to a God who can be known? If you look at verses 4 through 7, you see this response of the psalmist. He's responding to what God has done. It's a response of true faith. A response of a real faith. How can someone respond to that which they don't know? Maybe we're ungrateful at times because we don't know God. 
we don't have a personal relationship with him. If all of what I'm saying is foreign to you, make sure that you know him personally. You can be as religious as you want to. Try to be as good as you think you can be. But we must have a personal relationship with him. And we must give credit where credit is due. And as we approach a season where we focus on thanksgiving, a people who know God respond by giving thanks. Being grateful, expressing our thanks. All we have to do, do is look back at what God has done. We only have to look and see how we've experienced him lately. Denzel Washington is an award-winning actor. He's made it public that he reads his Bible daily. And he's consistently striving to get up and speak about what God has done for him. At a church banquet, he urged his listeners to have an attitude of gratitude for God's goodness. And listen to these words as he shares at this banquet. He says, give thanks for blessings every day. Every day, embrace gratitude. Encourage others. It's impossible to be grateful and hateful at the same time. I pray that you put your slippers way under your bed at night. So when you rise in the morning, you have to get down on your knees. And while you're there, give thanks. Give thanks. A bad attitude is like a flat tire. Until you change it, you're not going anywhere. Church, in order to be a grateful people, we must know experience God how well do you know him how have you grown lately in your knowledge of him may you search your heart may you search your relationship with him be sure that you know on a personal level Jesus Christ would you pray with me father in heaven we thank you for this day and we thank you for who you are and what you've done for each of us. We give thanks for your expression of love. Your son. Our savior. We give thanks to you. For being a God. Who can be known. We give thanks to you. For being a God that we can experience. On a day to day basis. We give thanks to you. For what we mean to you. Father I pray. For these gathered in this room. For these that are watching this through Facebook Live, I pray for each person that hears my voice and if we've considered your word, Father, I pray that they know you personally. And if they don't, Father, I pray that this will be their moment to enter into a relationship with you. Father, may they be able to surrender their all to you and experience you. Father, we give thanks today, and we praise you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me as we conclude our time of worship, singing, I surrender all. And like I said, if you don't have that personal relationship with him, you haven't had that encounter with him, please make this your moment to start that relationship.
appreciate you, brother. Appreciate your leadership. May this be our prayer. Surrender all. May you experience God this week. I've been praying for you that you'd have eyes to see God at work around you, through you. May you know God better this week than you did last week. Don't forget all the activities going on in the life of this church. I'm counting on you to be able to read. I know you can. You've got a bulletin. There's a Thanksgiving dinner. There's the bundles of, of love, the shoe boxes. All that's taking place. We need to know about what's going on. Thanksgiving dinner's coming up. We need you to sign up. There's a piece of paper out there. We need to be planning and know that you're going to be here. you also notice the offering boxes back here to my right and in the hallway. And if you have your tithe and offering, your gift to God, please share that. Place that in the box. May God bless you. May He keep you. May His face shine upon you. And may He give you peace. Redeem, redeem, redeem by the blood of the